many artists like Hankali, like Kagoshima, Sigizo, and who else there? This is Lala. Yeah, Chao. Yeah, and at the same time, we doing the, a lot of studio interviews at our studio as well. So then I've edited them both for the podcast and um, for my radio show here in Japan. So, two words with one stop. Hey, hey everyone. Um, I'm going to start off. Thank you, Megumi. Uh, I'm going to start talking about uh, the origins of uh, Kikeo. Uh, Kikeo was basically an idea I thought of during the summer. I was thinking about what should summer be ready to do next. And, uh, I was, and it just came to me that we, we should do a podcast show. And I listened to a whole bunch of uh, Japanese music related podcasts. And I thought, hey, let's do this, but better. So for those who are not familiar with the term Kikeo, it's a declarative way of saying listen up in the Japanese. So basically, I would say it's like, Kikeo, something like that, in some degree. And the show mostly focuses on uh, interesting stories of Japanese pop culture and sometimes current events in the Jap regular Japanese culture. And, but also, obviously, most importantly, we wanted to also wanted to promote Japanese artists as well, since after all, general focuses on Japanese music. So we put a little segment uh, called uh, Kore, Kore o Kikeo, which means listen to this. Listen to this, and to highlight any awesome artist recommendations. So far, we highlighted bands such as Boom Boom Satellites, Oral Vampire, Rad Wimps, 1OK Rock, Does, Midori, Clay, and Nightmare. As of right now, uh, Kikeo is playing music from JapanFiles.com to promote a variety of great Japanese music for everyone to listen to. I'm not sure uh, most of you know this, but uh, most of the Japanese music companies, they really they don't allow you to play their music on the internet, pretty much, podcasts, radio, whatever. We usually have a lot of run-throughs just to get a feel for what we're going to talk about, and if we screw up, we have to do the whole thing over because <laughs> Megumi, she's a perfectionist. <laughs> and if we, yeah, and if, you know, if we do something wrong, she would stop us and be, do it over. But, do no, it but, over. but it's a great thing though, honestly, yeah, because a, she, she is a professional, right? Yeah. And what she does. So, so we thank you for it. Sure. <laughs> thank you for it, honestly. And like I say, you know, we've done multiple takes. And we would communicate on the topics that we all chose for the show. And we make sure that how, you know, how to flow into the next one. And, you know, obviously we wanted to make the show more like a professional radio yeah, show. Like a and another thing is, you know, the reason why we're doing the KKO radio is probably we need a new media on the internet because most of you are uh, on the internet all the time and when playing this. So hopefully we can develop a KKO show to the next level. And in the future, like, we can play like 24 hours a day. Thing. <laughs> what do you think? That's a big goal. Big goal. 24 hours is a bit much, don't you think? Why not? It's a radio. Radio is like a water faucet. You know? <laughs> you turn on the radio, you, only, you always get something you want. That's a radio. It's the most important thing is consistency. Yeah, consistency. Yeah. Consistency. The most important thing is stress. Yeah. So I uh, speed up a bit, but uh, that's the uh, situation right now, pitching the Japanese music. And I've been hearing about uh, the lack of communication between American management and Japanese management companies when we have a Japanese band coming into the United States. And you know, I saw what you know the communication about BAMS, and I, I had another friend of mine. She's interviewing BAMS, and that's exactly what she had gotten through. They said, "Oh, they only allow you a certain set of questions." It seems that, this is just from my perspective, that a lot of Japanese management is like, okay, this is what we want the artist to say, you don't want, we don't want them to say anything else, and is there any, I mean, what are the ways that you have to, in a way, combat that when you have a Japanese fan to come over? And like, first of all, they don't want to be interviewed by fans or fanzines or fan web magazines, but yet again, the only questions that they allow interviewers or prospective journalists to ask are, Fan questions, <laughs> pretty much. Um, you know, miscommunication, it, you know, unfortunately happens um, in ways that you can't predict. Um, so, you know, keep control of the factors that you have control over those questions. Um, I can tell you there was, who here just saw Despair's Ray? 
come to the U.S. Oh, one hand. <laughs> one, two, three, three. Oh, there we go. So, you kn there were supposed to be two shows uh, in New York City, and that second show got canceled uh, totally, entirely out of their control. Their Japanese management basically booked their plane tickets to fly out on the second day. <laughs> You know, so they, they would never, they had to be on a plane for that second show. If you're doing an in-person interview, you have a little more leeway. Like, mm -hmm. when I interviewed AKB48, like the management had you submit sample questions, which turned out when you got there were the only ones you were supposed to ask. I just didn't listen. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, if you're in person, once you have that material in your hand, there's really nothing barring you from publishing whatever they answer. So if they try and threaten you, so I mean, sometimes um, you might get a, a Japanese label that comes back and says, oh, you know, can we review your interview before you publish it? Uh, I'm gonna tell you that 99% of professional uh, media, they don't allow the management to review interviews. You just publish it, it gets published as is. What kind of organized effort is being made uh, since Clear Channel and Infinity control and crush everything in terms of American radio. What, and they do it gently. Um, what kind of organized effort is being made to really approach them and, and sell Japanese music uh, as a mainstream ideal? I'm wondering why you came up with this kind of question. Because it's the largest market, and you do kind of have to tackle the larger markets as well as the college radio stuff. Yeah, I understand that, but the there's no market here. I mean, there's no marketing here. You know, you have to do the, you know, the marketing is the uh, result of the marketing. Do you understand that? Of course. The market, okay, here's a market. That's, you know, you see, for example, the Clear Channel, look at, you know, the charts, okay, mm -hmm. the research. And, oh, here's a market, you can make money playing this music. That's why radio stations choose the format. Okay, this market, you know, R&B is the uh, very effective, so they choose it very profitable, right? And then that market probably does the, uh, the classic rock could be uh, very profitable, so they can choose it. So this should be a market marketing result about the Japanese music. If there's no marketing, yeah, nobody ever done that. So that's really like you know before anything, you know, so commercial radio is about the commercial profit. That's that's the reason. If you look at the Latin market, that Latin market is a prime example. I mean, 20 years ago, the Latin market, who would have think that would be so popular? I mean, it's all demographics, and the Asian demographic is growing. So as an Asian demographic, we should also say to the big broadcasters, hey, we are a consumer base. We pay the money. So why can't you play some, something that's also for us as well? And you look at the Latin market, it's booming because of the demographics, too, some of the gaps. That's so true. That's so true. Because the Asian market is growing, but the Asian people are pretty much, you know, very quiet. Quiet <laughs> market. So they just raise their voices, and it's just like, a, you know, play what we want, we want to listen. Yeah. yeah. That's very important, yeah. too. I think it's the same. I think, you know, I think we discussed this before we moved once, that the Japanese people, they don't like to take risks, right? Am I correct? In terms of the, they, they don't, don't like to take, take risk in an overseas market, right? Or are they just not unaware? No, because Japanese uh, Japanese artists are, you know, the, the big artists like Abi, they're making a lot of money in yeah. Japan. So it's just taking off, you know, like leaving Japan for a week to, you know, fly over and perform. They're just taking the risk because they are losing the, a week worth of work over there. You know, that's the, uh, the business decision yeah. too. All right, now I have to, uh, two quick questions here. Now, you mentioned earlier that um, some Japanese corporations uh, or Japanese music companies can actually uh, take action against radio stations. Have, have any of you experienced that sort of action from a major Japanese label when you're playing their music? In my case, I must say no, because I know so much about what's going on there, so I don't even take risks. You know, and okay. if I do it, like I know because most of the uh, the labels, people just like you know, we've been working together, so it's right. just kind of friends. So if I play that, they have to, you know, someone close to me will lose face or something like that towards the uh, okay. other organizations. But I don't think they're gonna take the action, you know. But it's right. not nice not to do this because it's about, you know, if you know about that. Right, so that's Yeah, because I know, so I can't really do that. I can't break the rule. 
Okay. I'm one of the people that believe that music died after 1991, at least American music did. Uh, it's the truth, folks. Um, what, what do you think in the future? What, uh, what are your plans or how, how are you going to kind of preach to the rest of the United States to kind of push this uh, new, new uh, Japanese sort of fusion or we can have so, some sort of an English-Japanese fusion radio station? What are your uh, future ambitions to try to convince the American public and the, com the uh, radio stations and uh, along with uh, Clear Channel and all of the other uh, sort of radio syndicators out there? It's a very, very right. useful marketing tool. The more people listen to us, word's going to get around. Eventually, some big wig's going to hear it. And eventually, they'll hear everyone else and what they want. And that's probably the method we're going with right now, along with hosting live events, covering you know local concerts, you know small and big artists. I think people should also be tweeting, you know, exactly. uh, tweeting too, because using, right. using, you know, the online media, just, you know, whatever artist you're into, let everybody know. I don't care if it's spam. Just do it. Get it out there. Educate people. That's the way. I want to note that um, I'm going to quote a famous businessman. He, Twitter is word on mouth on steroids. <laughs> Period. It I is. I agree with that. Yeah, Twitter search. Use Twitter search too. It's, it's a wonderful search engine. Use that to search up Japanese, you know, just type in Japanese music. I sometimes do that. I'm like, amazing. I just get all these interesting responses like, oh, I love this right now. I'm playing this. Those things are really true. You mentioned that um, sometimes Japanese band managers will um, kind of nix your questions and that sort of thing. But in general, do Japanese bands cooperate with you guys um, to help promote their bands here in the States and to get a wider fan base? Everything is new here, you know, and it's just this, for, to them, the journalism here is very aggressive. So this is kind of, you know, kind of afraid of that, you know. <laughs> just like, you know, they're used to it. So that's the, uh, I think it's just still an early process for them to get into the market. So they need to learn about it and they should be educated, like, you know. And I'm trying to teach them how different it is, but. Yeah. You know, it's it's just difficult. You know, it's they not don't easy. Listen. Yeah, they don't listen actually. So it's better for them to tell them what the deal is. You know, if I tell them, I am a part of them. So it's a little tricky. You know what I mean? Uh, because I'm part of them. So like, you know, why are you saying that to me? I I thought you were with us, kind of thing. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Hello. Thank you for this panel. I've been learning a lot. Um, I got two questions. First of all, I don't know whether or not this was missed the very first portion of this panel. But what inroads have been made in regards to HD radio and satellite radio, for example, specialty Japanese channels on Sirius or on HD radio? HD is a part of the, uh, the traditional terrestrial radio stations. You know, like for example, uh, one radio station has a terrestrial, you know, traditional, and the station owns the HD, so it doesn't, it's, it's the same thing. You so know, it's similar to terrestrial long. radio in the way that works? Uh, I'm sorry? It's similar to traditional radio in the way that works? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Okay. the same thing. And the second question, how do I intern with any of you guys? You guys are great. I'll sweep you floors, I'll get your coffee. <laughs> our time, our time, thank you. Yeah, we, can answer, we can answer that question, question uh, after. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you very, very much. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.